All right, let's get started. Okay, so in the next uh, hour or so, we're going to talk about this here. This is the Microsoft HoloLens device. And I will also tell you how you can develop for it. Um, even after working one year and developing for it since over a year now, it's really still impressive what it can do. And I'm still blown away about all the features we can um, you know, develop with the HoloLens. Um, I've been doing VR, AR, and computer graphics development since more than 10 years now. And the HoloLens device is, is something you know, we just have dreamed about a few years ago. And now I'm literally holding it in my hand, right? So this is pretty cool. And it's not just the HoloLens, by the way. If you have seen some of the announcements from Microsoft's Windows 10 event last week, they are also partnering with OEMs that will bring VR devices running on the Windows holographic platform. And they will feature inside-out tracking, which is really exciting, if you ask me, because they will go out for a really low price point. So that is pretty cool. And in the talk today, I'm going to first set some, <coughs> sorry, some terminology straight. What is VR? What is AR? What is mixed reality? Why is the HoloLens called mixed reality? And then I will tell a bit about the HoloLens itself. And probably a lot of you will already know that, but I want to set, you know, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page and before we go a bit deeper into more advanced topics. Uh, then I will share some of the learnings uh, my team and I have learned while developing for the HoloLens since uh, more than a year now. And we will also have a live demo. So I'm going to show you how you can build the HoloLens application with our favorite tool, Unity. And it's an extra pleasure that I will also be joined by Andrew and Brandon from Unity that are working on the HoloLens stack at Unity. And they will share some insights about the spatial mapping, holographic remoting, and so on. My name is Renny Schulte. I'm Director of Immersive Experiences at Valorum Consulting. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft MVP for Windows development. Uh, if you're not familiar with the MVP thing, it's basically an award Microsoft gives out to independent experts. So not, I'm not employed by Microsoft, right? Um, but I share the knowledge. You know, I, I like the technology, so I go out to conferences, I blog about it, and so on. So that's why I got this award. Cool. Uh, a few words about the company I work for, uh, Valorum Consulting. We do a bunch of different technologies, cloud computing, uh, like Azure, CRM-based solutions, um, Office 365, as well as, <coughs> sorry, as well as user experience design and development. The company, uh, which is now the user experience group, was formerly called Identity Mind, so I'm just mentioning that because some videos might still show the Identity Mind logo. Um, yeah, we have been doing HoloLens development since more than a year now. We, got, uh, we were part of the so-called HoloLens Agency Readiness Program. So we got access to hardware and the SDK and are building a couple of applications. And that's why I'm here today to share some of our learnings with you. I'm rolling a quick video that shows you some of the HoloLens work we have been doing before we dive into the content. Right, enough of the marketing, huh? So first, let, let me set some terminology straight. What is VR? Um, and like I said, most of you will probably know that already. So virtual reality is a fully immersive multimedia solution, which means you're fully inside the virtual world, right? You're fully inside the virtual world. Don't see the outside world around you. Uh, augmented reality, on the other hand, is not fully immersive, which means you still see um, the world around you. And probably most of you have a smartphone and have an AR app installed on it. And what you usually do is you, you point the camera at some kind of marker, which is then tracked by the application. And on top of this marker is a virtual object shown on, in your screen. So AR is not fully immersive. You see the real world, which is augmented with virtual objects. So how does the HoloLens fit in? The HoloLens is a so-called mixed reality head-mounted device, which means it basically spans both. First of all, 
you augment your reality with the HoloLens, right? You have those nice uh, semi-transparent lenses here in the HoloLens, and they can fade in virtual objects into your view. So you see the real world with your own eyes, right? Not through another screen. With most AR apps that run on mobile devices, you see the real world via the camera stream. But with the whole lens, you see them through the lenses. So you actually see the real world, plus the, the blended in uh, holograms. But you can actually also get transported into a virtual world. And there's a very good game for the whole lens in the store. It's called Fragments. It's basically a kind of a crime scene game. And it transforms your room in a crime setting. And it's really nice, nicely done. It's very immersive. So you really feel that your room is actually the crime scene. So that's why all, you know, the whole lens is called mixed reality. You can basically do both. Of course, it's not full virtual reality, right? The whole lens is a fully untethered device, which means there's no cable connected. It's not like a real device like the HTC Vive or the Oculus, where you have a cable connected and the computing is done on a PC. The HoloLens is fully self-contained. It has all the computing inside the device, right? It has all the computing in here. It runs Windows 10, which means you can also install a Windows Store application. You can open Microsoft Edge browser, pin the browser tabs on your walls, in your room, etc. Another nice feature is, uh, of course, you can walk around with it, right? You're not on a cable. You're not on a leash. You can freely walk around in the room. And you can also implement so-called multi-lens solution. So if we would all wear a HoloLens right now, we could still see each other, right? but we could also see the same hologram together. That is a solution you can implement via networking. And that is a very unique factor compared to virtual reality devices, where you're basically, like I said, fully in your own world. And with the HoloLens, you still see the, the world around you. It has a bunch of sensors. Most importantly is, of course, also the IMU, the Notional Measurement Unit. It's basically the rotational sensor of the device. And then you have a bunch of cameras here. So you have two here on the right side, two on the left. And those are the so-called environmental cameras. And they basically are used to track the device in the room. So that's how the device can know where it is in the room when you walk around. And so it can make sure that the holograms are stable. And there's another important camera inside here. It's a depth camera. It's basically an IR camera, which measures the distance to the, to the distance to the object. So it can basically reconstruct the room. And together with those environmental cameras, this is called spatial mapping, what the device does. It can map the room out, so you can place your holograms, your virtual objects, inside the room at the correct position. It also, um, it also has a microphone array, so it has a bunch of microphones here, which are used for speech recognition. Right? All right. Um, I mentioned the lenses. Another piece is, of course, inside here is a custom motherboard. So you have a bunch of uh, chips. CPU, GPU, of course, and a new coprocessor Microsoft calls the HPU, the Holographic Processing Unit. It's responsible for running the spatial mapping, gesture recognition, speech recognition. And so those things are done by a specialized coprocessor. It also has RAM uh, storage, of course, and also batteries because it's self-contained. So it needs to have batteries. Batteries are here at the end. And it runs three to four hours. And this is really impressive when you consider what it does, right? Yeah, these are also pretty cool. So you have those tiny speakers here, left and right, the, the red ones here. And they provide a very nice spatial sound experience. So when I tried out the device the first time, I was expecting some, some good visual quality. But I didn't expect that the spatial sound is so well done with those tiny speakers. It's really very nice. And um, the spatial sound for an experience really is the icing on the cake. Because you can sense where the sound is coming from, right? You hear a sound in 3D, and you immediately turn your head. You know where, the, where the, the thing is going on. You know where the hologram action is going on. So you know where to turn your head. This is a very important point that is often not considered for experiences. But spatial sound is really important. All right, so HoloLens input. The HoloLens follows the so-called GGV paradigm, which means gaze, gesture, and voice. So when you wear the device on your head, I think about the gazing as it would be like a laser pointer and shooting out a laser ray. So when you, when you rotate your head and we're looking at this is the gaze cursor, this is the gaze ray. And this is how you can set the interaction focus for, for your interaction. If you think about the desktop world, it's basically your mouse move, right? It's your mouse cursor. And then it supports a bunch of gestures. The most important one is this here. So raise the index finger and tap the air tab. And this air tab is basically, if you think about desktop world, your mouse click, right? So you gaze at something, set the focus, and then air tap 
to actually trigger the action. Since, of course, you have a limited set of input, uh, voice input is really important with the device. Because you have a very good natural user interface, and the device does a great job recognizing speech. As I said, it has a microphone area, and it's basically just sitting above your mouth, right? So it can really well recognize the speech. So how can you develop for it? Well, first of all, you can use Direct3D. As I said, it's a Windows 10 device, and currently it's running Direct3D 11. So you can use C++ and code with C++ for it, or use C Sharp and uh, a wrapper like Sharp DX, which is basically just a wrapper around Direct3D. Or you can make your life much easier and use uh, middleware like Unity, right? Which is, uh, we all love Unity. We are at Unite, right? So <laughs> who am I am talking to here? So. Yeah, super efficient workflow, and since uh, Unity 5.4, uh, HoloLens is basically built in. HoloLens support is built in, and thanks to Andrew, Brandon, and, and our team, basically, there really is a dedicated team working at Unity for the HoloLens integration, right? So it's a really a safe bet to use Unity for HoloLens development. Another indicator for that is um, a lot of the applications and games you find in the Windows Store for HoloLens, which are made by Microsoft, are actually built with Unity. And also, a lot of the tutorials you find online are also using Unity for that. So definitely, Unity is a safe bet for HoloLens development. And yeah, Unity is still free for personal use. I hope that will uh, be also the case in the future. I guess so. Um, and you can also use, actually, the HoloLens emulator for free. So you can download the HoloLens emulator as well, so you don't even need to have a device. And you can get started right away without having to pay anything. Cool. Enough of the theory. I would say, let's, let's open Unity. Um, first of all, I will show you the application we're going to build on the HoloLens device. So what I'm doing now, I put on the HoloLens, and then I will open an application where I can stream to the PC what I'm seeing with the HoloLens. So you should be able to see that on the screen. All right, so let me open that application. This is the Microsoft HoloLens Windows application. So you can stream the HoloLens content to the PC. All right. So you can see what I'm seeing there. And now I'm opening the Start menu with the gesture. This is the Bloom gesture, right? This is how you can bring up the Windows Start menu. And then I'm opening an app called Hall of Fame. And this is the app we're going to build in a second in Unity. I call it Hall of Fame because we're in Hollywood, right? So I figured let's do something which has a local context. And I want to show you an API most people don't know which actually works with the whole lens. And this is what I call hand proximity interaction. So you can actually get the hand position in world space with the HoloLens, and you can use that to directly interact with holograms. So and that's why I figured, OK, let's, let's use a holographic hand imprint like you see in front of the shiny sphere, right? So what I have here is this, this 3D model with that hand imprint. I now did the art tab to place it. And if I tap again, I can place it somewhere. And what you see here, it, it aligns to the surface. So if I look there, it aligns to the, to the surface as well. So this is done with the so-called spatial mapping, which you can use in Unity. And I'm going to show you that in a second, how you can implement that yourself. And if I'm gazing around, it will adapt, uh, it will orient to the surface. And like I said, if I R-tap, I can place it there. Another gesture I implemented is the tap and hold. So I can do this, tap, and then hold it. And that's how I can move it up or down, right? It's kind of an analog movement. So let me put it there. And then I will show you the so-called hand proximity interaction. At least I call it hand proximity interaction. It's basically, this is how the device recognizes your hand. And there is an API where you can get the world position of the hand. So I can use that for, for direct interactions. So now we're going to do a hand imprint as a hologram. So I move down. Let me pull this up again. So I move down. OK. Let's do it like this. Let me place it there. That's easier. You see down and up, down and up. So. All right, so we have our holographic hand imprint, Hollywood style. OK, so let me show you how you can do that yourself. In, in Unity. It's actually pretty easy. So let me take this off here for a second and switch to Unity. So I'm using Unity 5.5 here, the current beta 9, or at least I have beta 9 installed. 
And um, I have a start scene here configured. So I don't want to show you how you can set up a fresh new scene for the HoloLens, because I did that as my Unite Europe talk. And I don't want to repeat that. So if you, if you want to see how you can start with a fresh Unity scene, you can watch the talk. It's online at YouTube. So, and I don't want to repeat that. So let's get started with the start scene, but it's pretty easy. We just have a main camera in here. We have a light, and we have this nice 3D model of that hand imprint. Uh, my friend and colleague uh, Jesse Havens made that. So shout out to him for the, for the great work here with the 3D model. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much the model we have in here. So let's add spatial mapping to that. And what I usually do, I create an empty game object and give it a proper name, like spatial manager or something. Reset the position, so it's at 0, 0, 0. And then we can simply add a component to it. And if you have done this with Unity 5.4 or have seen my Unite Europe talk, I had to pull in an extra library to actually get the spatial mapping uh, running. Now with Unity 5.5, you just uh, can select the built-in components and select the AR group here. Then you have spatial mapping renderer. So I open that. And this is basically yeah, rendering the spatial map, as the name implies. And I can also choose the render state here. So I could do occlusion, which basically means what you have seen in the demo. The, the real world object will then basically occlude your virtual objects, right? And there's another render state called visualization, which we're going to use now this, that will visualize the spatial map. And I don't want to go too much into details for all the components, because Andrew and Brandon will mention that in a, in a minute. Um, but there's another component we need to add. This is the spatial mapping collider. So open the spa AR, spatial mapping collider. And this is, of course, used for the collision detection. So if you have seen in demo, when I was looking at the, at the floor or here at the screens, it was adapting to it. And I'm using collision detection there, of course. So we need also a spatial mapping collider as well. So we now have the spatial mapping. Let's add this gazing, right? When I'm looking at it and then do the alt tab so it's actually placed. And I prepared a script for that. It's called the placement behavior. And we're just going to pull that on our container here, on our game object. And I'm opening that script, which I prepared, and show you a bit of the code there. So we're using the whole lens API called Gesture Recognizer for the art tapping, right? And it has a bunch of events. The, the tapped event is triggered when, when air tap is done. And then there are also the navigation events, which are done for this tap and hold gesture. Right? So it's the kind of analog scrolling movement, but the events are called navigation. And then I tell the, the re gesture recognizer what kind of gestures I'm interested in. So I'm just interested in air tapping here and navigation on the y-axis. So this movement I did on the y-axis with the tap and hold. And then I tell it to start capturing gestures. And if the tapped event is triggered, it's uh, firing my event handler here. And this event handler is basically just setting a flag. So is placed, is inverted, basically. It's a Boolean. And I used it in the update loop, where I just check if it's placed. Then I can already return, right? And if it's not placed, I do a raycast all from the camera. And with the, with the HoloLens, the camera in Unity is basically the HoloLens, right? The camera position is the HoloLens position in the room. And the camera rotation is the whole lens rot rotation. So what I'm doing here, I'm doing a ray cast all, shooting out a bunch of rays. And they will, of course, hit the surface collider, the spatial mapping collider. And then I will get the hits back, and I sort them by distance. So I'm just interested in the closest one. And then I will use that to set the position of our game object and also the up vector according to the normal of the hit, so it orients nicely to the surface. That's pretty much it, what we need to do to implement that feature with gazing and placement. So if you have used Unity 5.4 before, you, you probably know uh, that it's, you would have to build now. You would have to select Windows Store. You would have to select Universal 10 as an SDK, then Dike 3 d Then you would hit the Build button. This would generate another Visual Studio output for UWP, for, for Windows Store applications. And uh, then you would have to open that solution, build that, deploy it to the emulator or the device. And as you can hear, this is taking quite some time. This is a quite intense uh, deployment cycle. But with Unity 5.5, there is a new feature, which is called holographic emulation. So you can open that window here. And you can basically already test it out in the Unity editor. So let me put that window here. All right. And then I can select emulation mode. And I can remove to device, or I can simulate an editor. So if I select it, 
I could also select a room. This is useful to spatial mapping. I have a bunch of options here. And I can also say which kind of gesture hand I want to emulate. And then I just hit the build button, uh, sorry, the play button. And then I can use an Xbox 360 controller, which I have connected to my computer here. And I can use the left analog stick of the Xbox 360 controller to basically simulate the movement, the camera transform, so the whole lens movement, and the right analog stick for the orientation, for the head rotation. So if I look around here, left analog stick to move, and then right analog stick to, to look around. And if you, if you see, the color is changing of the spatial map based on the camera distance. And you might be able to sense that there is a sofa. So you see that it's orienting nicely. And then I can place it somewhere, like here. And I can also trigger an air tab with the A button or the, the shoulder thumb. And uh, then it's yeah, staying there, as you can see. It's not following the gaze. OK, so cool. That works. And it's pretty awesome that you can test it already in the emulator just with an Xbox controller. That's, uh, that's amazing. A lot of time saved. Good. So what else is left? We, of course, need to implement the hand imprint behavior. We need to uh, implement this hand proximity interaction, right? Where I made this hand imprint by touching the hologram. So let me pull up another script. But first of all, we need to add a collider to our uh, placement container. So that this piece, it needs a collider because we're using a collision detection uh, for this hand interaction. So let me add a box collider here. And I prepared some values like this. Right. Um, okay. Oh, oh yeah, that's too big. I forgot the zero here. There you go. Now it's fitting. You see, it's fitting nicely. And so we can we are going to use that collider. And now I'm attaching another script, which I'm going to show you in a second. I call it hand imprint behavior. And let me open that one. So what I wrote here is basically I'm getting a reference to the collider we just attached in the stop method. And then I'm attaching an event handle to the interaction manager. And this is the crucial API here for this direct hand interaction, basically. And it has uh, an event handler or an event called source updated, where I'm attaching this event handler to. And what I'm doing here, I first check the interaction source kind. So I'm just interested in hand interaction here. But there's actually more than that. So if you open that, you can see there's also controller, other, and voice. So you can also get more interaction uh, source kinds. And then I'm interested in the position. So there's an API to get the position here. And this outputs the hand position in world space as a vector free. By the way, you can get the hand position, but you can also get the velocity. Right? This could be interesting. So I'm getting the hand position here, vector free, as I said, testing it against our collider. If it's colliding, I'm doing a bit of math here to basically uh, um, compute a value between 0 and 1 to use that for an interpolation. And what I then do is I'm using that as a, as a blend shape weight for the skin mesh renderer, so kind of the morphing of the mesh, right? And I also wrote a little shader here where I'm using a crossfade um, property, a crossfade attribute to fade between two diffuse and two normal maps. That's pretty much it, what you need to do. So the important piece is if you want to get the hand position in 3D space, you need to show your hand like this. This is how the whole lens recognizes your hand. It doesn't recognize if you do like the closed hand or, or like this. You need to show the hand ready gesture, so index finger up. And then, yeah, that's pretty much it. So attach an event and check that, and then you get the hand position in world space. Pretty easy. OK, cool. So let's switch back to Unity. We could now also test this here in the emulator, but I'm also uh, in the editor. But I also want to show you something else. I want to show you that you can actually also remove it into the device and directly run it on the device without actually having to deploy it. So I'm selecting emulation mode, remove to device now. Same window, holographic emulation. And then I have to enter the remote machine name, IP address, for example. Fortunately, it memorizes those. So I can just select the one, uh, disable audio, and then I hit the connect button. And Unity crashes. Well, that can happen, right? As I said, it's an early beta version, so we're all developers. We're all friends, right? So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not mad about you, right? It's all good. It's all good. And you have to be prepared. So I prepared, of course, a finished scene as well. 
which I can just open because I didn't save, as you noticed. So. And I don't want to redo everything. So I'm just opening the finished scene, which basically is the same one we just built, uh, but it has all the stuff. So let's give it another try. Open the window, holographic emulation. Uh, put it in here. Select remote to device. Select the IP address. We don't need audio. And then hit the connect button. <laughs> and you see it's yellow. So this little dot is yellow. So it's actually waiting for the connection on the device. And what I'm going, doing now, I'm splitting my screen here. And then I, I also opened the live streaming again. So you could see what I'm seeing with the HoloLens and also the Unity editor at the same time. All right. So bring out the start menu again. First, close the application. And then there is an app you can install from the store. It's called Holographic Remoting. And this is basically the client piece that has to run on the HoloLens in order to enable the emulation, uh, the holographic remoting. All right, it's connected. You see the, the dot turn green. So I'm connected. And then I just place, press the play button inside Unity. And then I give it a few seconds to uh, establish the connection. Right? Should do this. There we go. That was it. Yeah, now, now it's good. You see that? So I'm actually having remoting. Yeah, hand claps for those guys, right? I'm just showing it. <laughs> All right. So I can do the same thing which I just done now, right? I can place it. I can do the hand imprint. And the actually, the actually computation is done on the device. The actually uh, it's not done, sorry. The actual computation is not done on the device. It's done on the PC. So what this holographic remoting app on the HoloLens does, it basically sends the input from the device to the PC. Unity Editor computes the scene and then streams the result back into that uh, holographic remoting piece. And let me show you something even nicer. So I could, of course now, directly change things in the editor. So if take a look here, I'm, I'm changing the scale, right, in the editor, and I'm seeing it directly reflected in the whole lens. Now, that is, that is really cool. So that enables really a nice development workflow, right? So awesome stuff, guys. All right. I'm glad that worked. So let's disconnect first. All right, good. Let me put off the thing and switch back to the slides for a second. And of course, I put up all the code here. I showed you the whole Unity project. I put it up on my GitHub account. So I will share the link after the session. So you can download all of that after, after the session and try it out yourself and play around with it. Cool. Of course, uh, just in case the live stream would fail, I went to the Shiny Sphere, though, and <laughs> recorded the video there. <laughs> right? So yeah, that is, that is fun. And you know, you wearing the whole lens in public is kind of weird, right? But we're in Hollywood anyway, so no one cares, right? <laughs> so there was this weird guy wearing a whole lens, but no one actually, you know, noticed, and it was just fine. So yeah, good stuff and good. But I showed it live, so we can skip the video for a second. Okay, now it's a pleasure for Andrew and Brandon to come on stage and uh, tell you a bit about uh, the inner workings of the spatial mapping and the holographic emulation. And um, yeah, come on over, guys, and then I will, I will get back in a second. Thank you. Hey, guys. I'm Brandon Fogarty from Unity Technologies. Uh, I work on the VR AR team. So by now, you've seen some interesting capabilities of the HoloLens and the kinds of mixed reality experiences you can create. You might have an idea for a holographic experience that you'd like to create, but you might not know where to begin. Uh, as you can see in the picture, when I first started developing a mixed reality, I had a lot of questions. Like, for example, how do I take a hologram and put it on a physical surface? And since I don't really know anything about the environment until I put the headset on, do I even use the Unity Scene Editor? And is there some new special object or component type that I'm supposed to use to represent a physical surface? And if there is, how do I use that physical surface to occlude holograms and game objects? 
To understand and answer these questions, we need to figure out how does the HoloLens work with Unity to create spatialized data. The HoloLens is constantly scanning your environment to create a spatialized mesh representation of your physical world. And we needed to somehow come up with a way to take this raw mesh data and put it into a format that our Unity developers could begin using. We wanted to allow you to continue using the same tools and concepts you're already familiar with. So that's exactly what we did. If you've worked with Unity long, you'll know that we have a standard component that's been around for a long time called a mesh filter component. And essentially all this does is it contains uh, mesh data. But it provides us a unified way to have other built-in components and custom components access the mesh data. So essentially what we do is we take the raw mesh data from the HoloLens and we put it into a format that the mesh filter can use. And then that way it's kind of like business as usual. You can use all of the standard built-in components with your spatial map data. For example, if you want to render something, you need a mesh filter component and you need a mesh renderer. Again, if you need to interact with geometry, say with physics and raycast, then you would again use a mesh filter component and you would also use a mesh collider component. The way that the components work is essentially they listen within a bounding volume from the operating system and they handle events whenever surfaces change. The key events is any time a surface has been added, updated, or removed. And when this happens, the components will actually generate game objects that contain this mesh filter component. The mesh filter component will actually store a representation of the physical surface. Now, it's important to note that these spatialized surfaces do not maintain a one-to-one -one relationship with the physical surfaces. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that when you get a spatialized surface, it might contain, say, half a desk, a trash can, and a portion of surrounding walls and the floor. But that surface will continue to be updated at a set interval until the surface is removed or until you explicitly tell the component to stop updating that, that mesh. Another interesting aspect of the components is that they're extendable. So what this means is if there's any kind of functionality that you'd like to add that we don't support, simply create a new class like you would for any other mono behavior and derive from one of the built-in spatial mapping components like the spatial mapping renderer or the spatial mapping collider and it will just work. Uh, of course, you can overload some of the methods inside of uh, these components and you can add additional components if you would like. So Unity ships with two built-in spatial mapping components. And the first is the spatial mapping collider component. Essentially, this is going to create game objects with the mesh filter data that contains the spatialized mesh representation of a physical surface. But it's also going to automatically add a mesh collider component. And this will allow you to immediately begin interacting with the surface via physics and raycasts. We also have a spatial mapping renderer component. The spatial mapping renderer component works very similar to the way that the spatial mapping collider component works. Uh, oftentimes, you'll not want to actually visualize the spatialized mesh. Instead, you'll simply want to use it to occlude holograms and game objects. And this can be achieved by simply setting the render state to occlusion. When you set it to occlusion, the way this works is the spatialized mesh will essentially be colored black because black is transparent on the HoloLens since the HoloLens uses an additive display. However, the spatialized mesh will still be written to the depth buffer, which allows us to occlude holograms that are behind it. One other interesting note is that uh, you will be able to actually add additional details to this mesh. Uh, so that's, that's really interesting. Um, if you need to visualize the mesh, you can also set that render state, and you can add your own custom materials and shaders, or you can simply use the built-in ones. So the spatial mapping components are really interesting. They allow you to just get up and running uh, very quickly with spatialized data. Uh, however, Unity also allows you to use what we call our low-level scripting API that gives you the maximum control over your spatialized data. In fact, our spatial mapping components use this exact same API. However, if you use this API, you're going to be responsible for managing the life cycle of your surfaces. You'll also be responsible for prioritizing and generating the mesh data yourself. 
If you end up using the low-level scripting API, you'll be working with the Surface Observer object. The Surface Observer object is essentially a three-dimensional bounding volume. And again, inside of this bounding volume, surface changes will be reported to you that you'll then just have to handle. But before you begin using the low-level scripting API, again, I would encourage you to first take a look at the spatial mapping components, because they just work and they're easy to extend. Uh, that's kind of a high-level overview of how spatial mapping works in Unity. Uh, I'm now going to hand it over to my colleague, Andrew, who will talk about some of the other interesting tech we've been working on to make mixed reality even easier. Thanks, Brandon. So uh, one thing that we like to do when working on the engine is to get things to just work for you guys, whether that's improving workflow, as Renee was talking about with the holographic promoting and simulation, or just making it so that you guys can use constructs that you're used to or something similar to what you're used to so that you don't have to learn a completely new tool. So uh, the deployment workflow, as Renee was pointing out, is this kind of long and somewhat tedious list. And so how do we avoid that overhead? And it's with this holographic and remoting, or holographic remoting and simulation. Uh, so Renee already went over this quite a bit, so I won't say too much about it. One thing that I did want to make abundantly clear, if it wasn't already, is that when you're using the holographic emulation and just uh, playing inside the editor, the API will return things to you as if you were actually on the device. So whether you're using the spa spatial mapping that Brandon was talking about and, or even just the uh, update interval then uh, on the component, then the mesh will re-import every so often and rebake it according to how you told it to as if it were on the device. Uh, along the same lines as getting things to work as in a similar manner to what you're used to, we got audio working for you guys, uh, spatialized audio. This is really important for cues to the player and immersion. Uh, you can always just draw an arrow on screen to tell them to look to the right, and you can do that too, of course, but it's nowhere near as valuable as just hearing something, for example, just from the right speaker and knowing, oh, something's coming from the right over here. So all that you have to do for it is pretty much the same setup as you would for any other spatialized audio in Unity. Just set the spatializer plugin, on the, as you see on the left there, and once you do that, the spatialized checkbox on the audio source component in the inspector will show up. Just check that, and once you've done that, be sure to also set the spatial blend to 3D, or you'll still get the left versus right cues, but you won't get any of the distance attenuation, which you can still control through the graph on the audio source component as normal. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out to you guys is that we do have the Unity UI working on the HoloLens. Uh, it just works through the HoloLens input module. It's really similar to the standalone input module. All that you have to do is add it manually when you're working on the HoloLens. And they can actually sit side by side and play nicely together. So you don't have to worry about, say, you're deploying to multiple platforms and you don't want to have to mess around with your scene between builds. You don't have to worry about that with this. Uh, one thing that I did want to point out on this is that there are two new parameters compared to the standalone input module. Those are just because the, the HoloLens input module basically just takes gestures and gaze and interprets that into more or less emulating mouse movement and clicks. And those parameters down at the bottom that you see there are just to control uh, how the HoloLens input module does that. You can find a lot more information about that on the forum post Unity UI on the HoloLens. And it also includes a lot of details as to how to get set up with the UI for the first time. And with that, I'll hand it back to Renee. Thank you. All right, good stuff. Um, so the whole lens has a bunch of sensors integrated, like I talked about, right? It has all the, the mapping and a bunch of sensors. But it also has a Wi-Fi connection. And so there's even more sensors around us, right? The, our whole world these days is built out of sensors, basically. There's so many stuff, IoT and uh, you know, external cameras, microphones, and whatnot. So that's why I mean with, there's even more outside the box, right? Look at this guy, what he has all on his like crazy submarine and it's like all this stuff. And you can you can stream a lot of those sensor data into the HoloLens because it has the Wi-Fi connection and it has the UWP networking stack. So you can open a socket and can actually push a lot of data through it. And that's what I'm going to show you here in the video. This is a current technology we're working on. We call it HoloBeam. It's basically kind of a, yeah, we're taking a 3D camera data and stream it into HoloLens and render that in real time. So take a look at the video for a second. Hey, Justin, how are you today? I'm good. Very good. 
Uh, I just wanted to quickly talk with you about the latest changes in Holobeam I've seen. The two indigestions. So what you can really well. what you can see here is basically down on the right. I'm I'm sitting in front of a 3D camera and uh, the depth buffer and the RGB data from the camera is streamed into the Hololens. Uh, my my colleague and friend Justin is wearing. Say hi, Justin. Say hi, Chris. Hi. Hey. <laughs> yeah, good guys. Uh, um, so we're working together on that, and what we're developing is like we're taking the 3D camera data, uh, sent it over, streamed it live into the Hololens. And we have a specialized shader written for the HoloLens where we can basically render that as a point cloud out and uh, yeah, live stream that into the HoloLens. And we can push quite a bit of data. That's, uh, it was really, really nice that we were able to achieve that. And you can actually also download a demo application of that in the Windows Store for HoloLens. If you're one of the lucky people with a HoloLens, you can try that out yourself and you can see some, some pre-recorded frames, which, which is going to show in the next bit of the video. You can see uh, the, the piece that is in the Windows Store application. So this is what you, when you download the app, this is what you can try out, basically. Nice. And it looks, it looks good in the video, but if you try it out with the whole lens yourself, it's, it's really much more, much better. And um, yeah, it, it feels very futuristic, if you ask me. So when, when we started developing that, it really felt like, wow, this is really science fiction. This is, it feels like Star Wars, right? Or like, you know, when R2-D2 comes in and projects Leia and like, hey, blah, blah, you know? Or Minority Report, it's really, really kind of futuristic. <laughs> All right, cool. So let's talk about uh, some of the learnings uh, we learned um, by working with the HoloLens since more than a year now. And uh, I had a, a similar slide deck in my Unite Europe talk, but I called this is the Redux version because a lot of things has happened since May. Uh, my first recommendation is leverage the HoloLens' uniqueness in your applications or games. HoloLens is a very unique device, right? It has those, those special lenses where you where see the real world around you and objects blended in, but also it has that inside-out tracking. It has the spatial mapping where you can basically anchor holograms and place them at the real world, right? You cannot just let them float around in space. No, you can actually place them on the floor or on the table. So leverage that it's pretty unique with the device which is on the market, it's just this, right? It's the whole lens. And try to use that. Another piece I mentioned earlier is the multi-lens scenario. So multiple people are sharing the same, basically holograms, seeing the same stuff, also very unique with the device. So leverage that and, and take advantage of the unique factors of the device. The whole lens is de facto a mobile device, right? It, it doesn't have any connection to a PC. Like if you compare it to those high-end VR devices like Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, they do all the computing on a the computer. They're basically displays. Um, the HoloLens is not. The HoloLens is fully self-contained, does all the computing on the device, which of course also means you don't have the full computing power of a PC. You cannot put in a full-blown graphics card in there, right? It would just get too hot, burn the head or whatever, right? So you, you, want, you want to have a good mobile optimized solution. And if you've done mobile development before, you probably know that you should avoid overdrawing. Draw your pixels as simple as possible, right? Have a very simple pixel shader. Vertex lighting actually works for many things, so you can get away with that. And of course, you cannot use any depth of field, screen space, ambient occlusion, and those crazy screen space effects. That won't work. So HoloLens is a mobile device, treat it like that, and optimize your rendering that you have 60 frames per second. Because this is really crucial to run it with 60 frames per second, because when it drops to 30 frames per second, it can happen that the holograms become a bit unstable, right? They swim a bit, they drift, because the, it cannot adapt the position as fast as it can render, right? So the, if the rendering lags, holograms become unstable, which is an unpleasant experience for the user. So you want to make sure to optimize the rendering loop and run at 60 frames per second. Still, the device is quite powerful. It has actually multi-core CPU. And uh, we have an application we developed. It's called Holoflight. You can also download a demo of that in the store. And this is a real-time flight data visualization. So we are fetching flight data from a real backend. And we do this on a background thread, because it's a multi-core CPU. And we have to do quite a bit of number crunching to optimize the data we get. And so we put that off on the multi, uh, on the extra thread to have you know, the UI thread free from that work. Think outside of the box, what I just mentioned. We have a ton of sensors around us. So and the whole lens has a fast connection, so we can use that and stream a lot of data into the device. 
that it focuses on important things. What I didn't show you in the demo, but is actually implemented, is an API the HoloLens provides, which is called Focus Plane. And you can set this Focus Plane. You can, you can see that as it is used in the GitHub code of the demo I mentioned. It's basically just one line. What you do there is you set a position and a normal, a, f a plane, right? And this is where the HoloLens runtime will spend a lot of time to optimize stability. And in the demo I showed you, of course, I set the focus plane at the position of the concrete box, and the normal is pointing to the camera, basically, right? So that it's always, when I'm walking around, it's always optimizing this as the stabilization plane. It's a very important API. You need to run it every frame. You need to set it every frame, the position in the normal, uh, to make sure that the hologram is really as stable as possible. A similar API, but actually different, is called the World Anchors. And the World Anchor is something you can attach to a game object, which then uh, the HoloLens will then assign an own coordinate system to that World Anchor. And what this does is it makes sure that the hologram is always at the same position. Even if you walk out of the room and get back in, it will, because it has its own coordinate system, it will stay there, right? And the cool part about it is actually that you can persist it. So when I fly back home, I'm actually from Germany, so when I fly back home and put the whole lens on and go in back into my office, the device will recognize the room it was in, and then it will also show me the holograms I placed there, right? Because they are persisted. And this you can do yourself with the World Anchor API. It's pretty cool. Pay attention to the gazing. So as you have seen in the demo, when I was looking around and this box was attached to the gaze ray, it was kind of jittering a bit, right? And this is also because, if you think about it, is based on head rotation, right? And you, if, you, if you put like a long, like a ray on top of it, then you place an object, of course it's always a bit jittering because the head rotation is based on the IMU, a notional measurement unit, and this is a sensor. Like every sensor in the world, this has some bit of noise data, always a bit of jittering, right? So you want to avoid that. What you want to do is smooth that. There's a, an um, open source toolkit from Microsoft. It's called Hollow Toolkit. It's up on GitHub. And it provides you already a nice smoothing algorithm you can just attach, which smooth out a bit of the noise. We actually implemented our own smoothing algorithm, double exponential smoothing, because this gave us a bit of better results. But if you want to have a good experience, make sure you smooth the input you get from the device for the gazing before you place any objects on top of that so that it's more stable and doesn't jitter. Yeah, don't reinvent the wheel. What I mentioned is the Holo Toolkit. That's an open source project from Microsoft. Um, it's uh, maintained by Microsoft, but also takes community contributions and has a bunch of scripts, shaders, and whatnot. It's so really a good resource for getting started with HoloLens development. Also has some good test projects and, and samples and whatnot. Another good resource is, of course, always the asset store of Unity. You can actually use quite a few of the VR assets also with the HoloLens. And, of course, your own code is also a good resource. And what we do is... Instead of copying you know, all the script files from one project to the other, because we have multiple projects we're running in parallel, um, we actually made a C-sharp solution where we have all the script code in one central place. And then we can build a DLL and copy that automatically into the different Unity projects. There's the assets plugins folder where you can put in plugin DLLs and we can just use the script files from there and have just one maintainable C-sharp solution, have a post build step in there which automatically copies that. So if we have a bug in one script, we can just fix it and hit build, and it's updated in all the different Unity projects. So that's another tip I wanted to share. Offloading is an option. So what I've shown you was the holographic emulation with the remoting. And you can actually not just use it for development purposes, but you can actually also use it in, a, in an application, right? So you could offload the rendering to a PC. Of course, 99% of the time, you don't want to do that. You want to have all the computing on the whole lens. But there might be a case where you have a large, think about a large static model, which is just sitting there and has like millions of polygons, which you cannot render on the device itself. You could render that on a PC and stream that to the whole lens. The, there's a bit of latency, of course, but in some cases, it might uh, be acceptable. And there's another open source project also provided by Microsoft called um, the HoloLens Companion Kit. And it has uh, samples for the holographic remoting host. And this is going to show you how you can implement this holographic remoting yourself, if you're interested in that. But again, most of the time, you don't want to use that. You want to compute everything on the whole lens. But just in case, there is, there is a case where you want to do that. 
offloading is an option. In my Unite Europe talk, I had mentioned avoid the long deployment cycle and mentioned some scripts I wrote to actually simulate the gazing and gestures already inside the emulator by using your mouse. We can scratch that. We now have the holographic emulation with Unity 5.5. And uh, yeah, thanks to Andrew Brandon and Steve and Peter Fries, which are working in the Unity HoloLens team. And we got this stuff running, and it's, it's pretty awesome. It makes our life so much easier. Uh, with that, we're pretty much at the end. Um, I want to mention that the HoloLens is really an amazing device, and I still have the feeling it kind of changes, or it, it has the potential to change how we interact with computers. And it has the potential to change how actually all people interact with computers. And we should always keep in mind it's the first iteration of that device, and there's actually more coming, right? And it's not just the HoloLens, like I initially said, there's also the whole Windows holographic platform. And uh, Microsoft is partnering with those OEMs, which are bringing out VR devices for an affordable price tech, even with inside-out tracking. So this is really an exciting time to be a developer working in that space. It's really we, now we have the devices available we just dreamed about, or it, which were costing a fortune back in the days, right? And it's really, really good. Um, I put up here the, the link to my, to my blog and also my Twitter handle and whatnot, so you can send some questions there. And of course, we have a couple of minutes left. If you have some questions now, feel free to come to the mic and ask them. Hello, that's better. Um, as William Gibson said, the, the future is not evenly distributed. So when are you hoping that the HoloLens will actually be in the home of normal users? Well, that's a, that's a good question, but I cannot answer that. I mean, it, it's really depending uh, what the price tag is. And uh, right now, the price tag is for the development edition, 3K. And for the enterprise edition, it's 5K, right? It's pretty much the same hardware, but it's a commercial license. Um, well, it, I mean, as I said, you need to keep in mind it's the first iteration of that device. And so it's, it's hard to answer. What is your take on that? Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, I mean, eventually, probably the price will drop. But for right now, you're exactly right. We've got development editions, and they're a little bit more expensive. Yes. Uh, will that remoting option be available at edit time so that I can walk around my space and move holograms and then hit play? Uh, I think that you would need to hit play first and have it import the meshes. What a lot of apps and games do right now that you can find on the store is that as a <coughs> preliminary step before actual gameplay starts, they'll do the spatial mapping, have it, you know, make sure have all the meshes are imported and pretty up to date for what the room represents or for how it's representing the room. And so you'll probably need to do the same thing while remoting. Okay, because what I'm getting at is that VR editor that we saw this morning, but, you know, in a HoloLens. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I that's a good, yeah. it's a good point. Let's do this. <laughs> uh, that'd Thank be you. fun to get that to work. Uh, I don't know of any plans to do so immediately, though. Vote. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, nice presentation, first of all. I saw your European one, so this one's cool how you added some new things to it. I just have a question about, like, I think it was a demo shown by Microsoft where besides just the static tracking and spatial match, ma uh, tracking of a room, they had something dynamic going on where the guy who was demo grabbed an object and seemed to recognize that and then used that as an anchor point to put a hologram. Do you have any experience with that? I can't seem to find personally any documentation around how to do that. I thought it was a neat thing. I don't know if it's maybe a private thing they did and it's in beta or, or alpha, I, should, I would say. Mm -hmm. So it, it tracked the hand or what? what yeah. Did you have an extra device in your hand? Or? Yeah, because like our experience with HoloLens is like it's good at tracking static, like a room, right? And you mm -hmm. can't really track like a, me throwing a pillow or something like that. Uh, but this demo that they showed was basically he had something in his hand that acted like as an, uh, you know, an anchor that could be recognized. And then using it as an anchor, Got it. he was able to attach kind of like a, look like the Covenant weapon from Halo. Yeah. You know? Yeah, so what you can do, you can of course also use the AR mocker-based tracking as well with the whole So it has an RGB camera in the front as well. Yeah. So that's what the guys from Rewarrior are using yeah. basically. I've so tried that, but. So uh, you could attach a marker to a piece you hold in your hand right. and then you can track the position, right? But the device itself recognizes only the hand if you raise the index finger like this. 
right? It doesn't recognize the hand if you bring it in like this. You need to show okay. the index finger. Right. And uh, so, but of course, you could extend that, right? You could also attach an object like a wristband or something. And like I said, you know, there's more outside of the box, so you could stream that into the whole lens. As long as you get the position and have a good update speed and synchronize the coordinate space, then you're good to go. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks again, and have a great day.